Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 230 for Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, or if it's your first episode, welcome to Gig Gab, <laughs> uh, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Band Zoogle, where promo code Gig Gab gets you 15% off your first year, and mintmobile.com slash Gig Gab, where you can get wireless service for just 15 bucks a month. We will talk about both of those in a little more detail throughout the episode. But for now, here and Dur- back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here now in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. Yeah, you are you are a musical nomad now, <laughs> in yeah. that you are a nomad in general, and yeah. and you are a musical person. So yeah, that's pretty crazy, man. How uh, how's life in the new digs? It's um, it's interesting. You know, it was a, it was emotional to sell the house that we were in for over twenty years, wow. and you know, raised wow. our family, wow. and you know, we're we're in the process of this path of moving to uh, another part of California. And, and it's relevant to what we talk about here because, you know, I have this band of 20 years oh, and yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. And you know, wh- wh- what are the implications on the band? How am I managing the band's expectations? How am I managing my own sanity and my own availability? So there's a lot of things going on, but right now we're um, in temporary, we're in a you know nice little rented town home and uh, you know, Everything is going on as usual, and uh, as we look for the next place that we want to live, so it's um it's different, you know. Having been in a big house for many years, and now you know we're kind of hunkered down in intimate quarters, but it's just the two of us, just Terry and I, and uh, we're doing good, you know. And uh, had a couple of gigs this past weekend, where you know I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Here, here's a good way to start this. Sure, it is way way more fun to collect guitars than it is to move when you have a collection of guitars. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a great way to encapsulate all of that. Holy cow, man. Yeah. So I have, I have, uh, I, I, I took uh, four or five guitars and they're on consignment at my favorite local, you know, small yeah. guitar shop. Yep. I have uh, some at my dad's house, some at one of my bandmates house. And uh, yeah. And I've, was, I've always was, found, I mean, that's it, it, true of in, in like a universal sense, but, but moving, moving is a great opportunity to, you know, clean house purge. and pare down to purge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In fact, several times, this is, we've been in this house coming up on 15 years and it's like by a, a long stretch, the, you know, the, the longest we've lived in any place at, together as a couple. Uh, and I've several times we were moving every five years for a while and it at every five year mark since we've been here, I've said, gosh, you know, we should pack like we're going to move and throw out all the crap that we would throw out if we were going to yeah. move like because someday the day will come when we will move and we will regret not having done that every five years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we did that over the course of time that we were getting prepared to sell. So we That's got rid good. of a bunch of stuff. But not guitars. I mean, you know, I mean, I kept kind of putting off the inevitable thing that I had to do. And like I said, you know, there are the ones I definitely don't need, won't play, don't play. You know, mostly they're just taking up space. So those those are getting sold. And then, you know, the ones that I will have are in safe storage for now. And and, uh, you know, they'll come home (laughs) when I have a nice place. Yeah, right. That's true. That's right. Yeah. You're kind of not only are you moving, but you're you're in limbo in a sense right now. So, yeah. 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 So, yeah. But That's it's all right. good. Had a couple good. good gigs this weekend. Uh, I did. Uh, House Rockers played one of our ticketed gigs on Saturday night. Went good. You know, we got a good machine down for it. Um, you know, we sold about 250 tickets for this one. So not as many as in past years or at past shows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but still a good payday. It's you a know, good number. Now, yeah. Yeah. Now it's, it's a low, it's a low stress thing. I mean, the, the, the engine that we built to kind of like do these things is pretty repeatable. Yeah. And when so we had the, when we had the fling fest engine kind of running in at full tilt and we were doing it like once a quarter or whatever, 
it was just yeah i mean it's starting this like starting any venture or project is stressful and and but exciting because you're it's new right then once it became a thing it was just like oh yeah just punch the ticket and you know you got to keep evolving yeah. it. but yeah well, that's good yeah that's good and the, you know the big lesson of all that stuff is that people want to go out and listen to music but they don't but there, there are well let me let me contextualize this people still love music but bars are not always the best place for them to consume music that's Correct. that's really the message of all this yeah and and even more with dancing people like to go out dancing but going to a bar is not necessarily where all people want to go out dancing so yep. this is just like a different let's call it let's call it a different channel to deliver our music yeah i like that yeah no it, it, it that, that's a good way to look at it the different channel yeah so speaking of channels i want to talk about our first sponsor because you got to get your music out there and Banzoogle can help you really make that easy they you know so i mean they're a website right it, but they are your website because they have this engine that is built not only for musicians but by musicians. So they know what you need in order to get everything up and running the way that you want it. They, they are so smart about the way they, everything that they announce, you know, and they, they've been a sponsor for a while. Every time they've got some new feature, it's like, right. They did it the right way. Like when they did their uh, fan subscriptions, it's commission free. You pay them for your website every month, but you know, when your fans subscribe to re receive, you know, like monthly rewards or access to your music or whatever to give you that recurring revenue, you know, they're not taking a commission of that because you're paying them for the, 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 the service of hosting your website there. They just provide all of these services and whatever you want. You, know, you, you pick what you want. You pay a different amount or whatever. And it's really, really smart. And they've got, you know, like their crowdfunding feature which is also commission free, but you can post your calendar there. I mean, everything, post your music, your calendar, sell your stuff, whatever you want to do. They've got it because they are musicians too. And they'll also send out emails all the time, not just about the features that you have on the website, but things to help you with just being a musician. Like they're really focused on making you successful or giving you the tools you need to be successful. And some of those are not even part of the website. It's really, really smart. So here's the thing. If you aren't already hosting with Banzoogle, here's the, it's awesome because you go to Banzoogle.com, you try it out free for 30 days, right? Then when you're ready to buy and like launch your site after you've sort of, you know, tested things and built it, you use the promo code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B, and you get 15% off your first year of any subscription. So by then you'll know exactly what you need and you're getting 15% off the whole thing for the whole year. They rock and are they thanks. They do rock. Yeah, you use them. So I yeah. do use them. And I would just add to everything that you said, in addition to them not nickel and diming you for every unique feature and, you know, Every feature is really built by musicians for musicians. It's it's the most compelling reason that any musician listening to this should go, you know, check out the site is because they get us. They get exactly the types of services we need and they don't nickel and dime you for everything. They also are they they have dozens and dozens of these themes. You don't have to be a web designer to really understand this stuff. You go, you you browse the different themes, you find one that works for the style of music or the vibe that you're trying to communicate, the brand that you're trying to communicate. You pick one and you just start dragging and dropping mostly. And it's really it's pretty wonderful. So you know, hats off. I'm a very happy customer and will be for a long time. Sweet. Thanks, Banzoogle, for being Thanks, a sponsor. Banzoogle. Um so we have well, actually we got a couple of emails, but but first, but first, <laughs> just wait for this. Wait till you see what happens next. We ended the last episode. In fact, the entirety of the last episode was a really interesting conversation that uh, generated, I think, more feedback than any other single episode conversation that we've had. I, I might not be right about that, but it sure feels that way. Certainly in yep. recent history. And uh, you want to you want to I mean, I figure we should we should put a button on that. So you want to you want to kind of contextualize this, my friend? Absolutely. In a big sense, the conversation was about, quote unquote, poaching. But what really was about was about trust and, you know, the communication that is that is um, prevalent between band members band leaders and band members uh, and band leaders and other band leaders. I mean, that, that was the conversation. And in a nutshell, 
the the analogy that I shared, the story that I shared was, you know, about a another band leader coming in, talking to someone in my band about possibly subbing for them. I shared that I felt a little disrespect that, you know, yeah. that there should be a there should be a leader to leader uh, courtesy. Um, I also tried to share, but clearly I was not very good at it, sharing that my issue was not with my band mates. I think a lot of the feedback that I've heard yeah. would be like, you know, you can't disrespect your band mates that way. And I thought I was making the point that I didn't even have a conversation with my bandmate about don't take that gig or anything like that. You know, and I, I was hoping to have shared that it is their decision whether they want to do it. And but I think the 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 weight of the conversation went mostly to an analysis of how I was treating my bandmates. And actually, I, I, I want to share with you, Dave, that, you know, not only, you know, of course, I respect your opinion, but, you know, you were quite emphatic in your position. I actually called the guy in my band and said, you know, I'd like to revisit the situation with you and how you felt about it. You know, I'd like to learn. Sure. And I'd like to be, you know, transparent about what I was feeling. And it's still weird to me that overwhelmingly, the feedback I'm getting is a well, trust your band members, which which that's not hard feedback. You know, that, that's not a foreign concept yeah, right. at all. That's that's good. However, yeah. but the concept that I would have some expectation amongst other band leaders seems to be met with a lot of, you know, disbelief. Like Raised that, eyebrows. That, that, yeah, that doesn't that that dynamic doesn't exist. And I'm still struggling with that, to be honest, well, because, me, again, let me help I, you I would that. give that I would give that to another band leader. And I have given that to other band leaders. Let, let me help you with that. Maybe, it, you know, because mm. I, because this, I think, is 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 the crux of where all that feedback came from, because though you and I ended that episode <laughs> sounding like we might have been disagreeing with each other, we're actually far more in alignment on this than anything else. Like having a band member that's, you know, not reliable or not committed at the same level as everyone else. That sucks. It doesn't matter whether you are involved in the leadership structure of the band or you're just relying on the band for your gigs or, you know, somewhere in between. Like that sucks. If you can't, if you've got this, you know, moving target, that's awful. Mm. So, you know, I, and maybe that's where some of this comes from is like, well, wait, why is it the only the leader of the band that's that's, you know, upset by this? Like, wait, this affects everybody. So that's I think maybe that's one part of it. But the other part is not every band is organized with a single leader. Right. And so how could anyone know how a band is organized. Like, and I think the example I gave to you is like Uptown Celebration. Anybody listening to this show, if you've paid close enough attention, you you could you could easily figure out figure out that Gary, our guitar player, is the leader of the band. No question. Everyone in the band knows that. Anyone watching the band on stage would have a really hard time figuring that out because mm -hmm. he doesn't run the show on stage. He's not the front man. Y you know, I mean, he kind of runs the show on stage, but he does it via either me or sometimes our lead singer, uh, um, uh, Marty, as the as that proxy. But those communications are very, very subtle. Yeah, you, you folks could all probably pick up on it. You know, if you watched a full gig, you'd be like, oh, that guy's calling the shots. Look at that. You know, but. To people in the crowd, he's just, you know, the quiet guitar player is really what he yeah. is, you, yeah. you know. So but and, and then and then compare that to Fling, where there is no one leader of Fling. I mean, if if there's ever a like major problem, which rarely there is, but, you know, Russ will be the one that sort of steps in and and fixes everything. But that's just sort of who he is. Uh, Mike books the gigs. I take care of like the website and building the set list. I, mostly I run the show on stage, although sometimes Russ, you know, Russ and I sort of share that that responsibility. So you'd be I, I guess the point is, how would another leader like how would someone know to come up to fling and be like uh, if they if it was you. Right. Because you definitely want to respect the leadership structure of a band, which is nothing wrong with that. I, it, I And I don't think anybody it has any issue. I certainly don't have an issue with that. It's the expectation that someone else would, would do the same thing um, where the, the eyebrows were kind of raised, but mm -hmm. it's um, you know, how would you know, like in fling, who would you talk to? Uh, you know, I, and, and that's sort of where I come from. It's like, well, if you want to hire, you know, the keyboard player or the drummer, go talk to the drummer. And if the drummer says, uh, I, you know, if the drummer is committed to the band, he's going to say, yeah, I don't have time or, or, when is the gig? Actually, yes, that's a night that we all have off. Yep. You know what? I can do it or whatever, you know, 
But I feel like you leave it up to the musician. That's just how I, I've always I handled get it. it. Yeah. And, and clearly we got some other feedback that, that, that there's that. And so here's my response. The number one thing that I'm concerned about through this whole conversation is my relationship with my band members and my band member. Right. Let me know that he felt the way that you're describing. He felt, which I is, that's important to me. Sure. So, so there's, there's that. And, you know, even my attempts to clarify with the band member, it wasn't about me questioning your judgment or your commitment. Literally. It was just, I think band leaders should have a certain amount of, uh, professional courtesy. Now yeah. it was regards to how would I know? Well, I kind of think it's my business to know. I know what other bands are out there. And if I didn't know, I would certainly ask the question. Right. But like I, but, but mostly I know. Right. And I knew the guy when he walked in sure. that, that he was the band leader of this other band. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that's just that again, yeah. the, but what happens is the good intention of wanting to protect my band from possible uh, uh, inconvenience, I guess we'll say. Yeah. That's, a, that's um, a, as fair a term as any. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Like, you know, the road to good intentions. Right. So yeah. it's, um, uh, uh, but clearly, you know, there, there was a life lesson here for me and, and I, I appreciate that. I, you know, I would still go ahead and I would want to be cool with other band leaders. I would want to, you know, exchange business with them. I would want to help them find, you know, if someone loses someone and, you know, a band leader calls and says, Hey, we just lost our guitar player. Do you know of anybody? Yeah. I would like that relationship with all band leaders kind of in my little, in my little area. I get it that people have a whole range of social skills that go along with that. Some people take friendly competition way too seriously. And some people, you know, make it uh, unfriendly competition. I get that that's a dynamic that's just human. And, and that's, that's a, yeah, there's a whole continuum there between either of those things. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I get it all. And like I said, uh, of this whole story, the only thing that's really, really important to me is my relationship with my band member. So, you know, a little bit of a lesson learned there. Check myself a little bit in these types of situations. Don't let my personal, um, my personal tendency to hold professional respect to the, uh, to the manner in which I, I give it to expect it back in all ways that way. That's a, that's a, uh, you know, that's fraught with problems. Well, it's, it, it's it going to lead to your own frustration, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, I certainly don't fault you for the way you approach things. Like th uh, frankly, it's, it's Matt, it, it is no surprise knowing you as long as I've known you that mm -hmm. that is exactly what, like you are all about respect, and like every you embody it seriously, mm. you know, and I, 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 I admire that in you and the, I, yeah, I think the problem is like, there's no problem with you going to someone else and saying, Hey, you know, do you mind if I approach your guitar player, or your keyboard player, or whatever? Um, it, like that's, I don't think anybody has a problem with that. That's, you know, admirable. It's just not everybody runs that way. In fact, yeah. as it turns out, most people don't. Very few. That's Very exactly few. Right. You had made out. a comment that, that there's a, the last thing I would want to say about this, you make a comment that I am drawing a delineation between band members and, and leaders. Yeah. And I want to explore that a little bit because I, I don't really think that that's what's going on. Okay. I mean, I, so, so your, your draft of this is that I've drawn um, now, and you know, the way that my band is set up. So, so, you know, I think in terms of, I own the problems and responsibilities, uh, of, of, uh, managing the business of my band personnel being one of those things, right. Yep. Selecting new personnel, yep. you know, finding subs, you know, all these types of things. So I own the responsibility for those types of things. And so what I felt I, I was doing was, identifying a potential problem that could potentially be a bit right again. So yeah. to me, I was entirely blind to the musicians feeling that they were um, not allowed to speak for themselves. I guess that's really what it came down to. Well, it wasn't I wasn't my intention. Let me, I, I think it's, yeah. And I, I, I think it's a different thing. I think it's um, that the concerns that you have as a band leader, it, th the way I interpreted what you were saying was that, your it, it, musicians in the band did not share those concerns. And, and, you know, here I am w waving my arms wildly saying, well, you know, when I'm in a band, this musician shares those exact same concerns. Like there is no difference. You know, I, I, I worry about all those exact same things, regardless of whether 
I am involved in the leadership structure or not. Not every musician is like that, but I would say enough of them are even the ones that have no interest in, you know, like aren't type A, like like I might be or, or perhaps <laughs> my co-host may or may not be. Um, <laughs> but, you, you know, like even the musicians that are just happy to be there, like are less happy when the other people can't be there because they can't play. Right. Like, mm-hmm. I, so that's, that was, to me, that was my only, that was the the crux of my resistance to that. There was some difference between band leaders and, and musicians like, whoa, 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 like we're all in this boat together. If the boat can't sail, ain't nobody sailing. You know what I mean? So that, that was all, that was, that was my, that was where my resistance on that came from. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So anyway, I'll put a bow cool. on it and just say, yeah, Good, Good lessons learned. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, some life lessons learned. Sometimes you got to check yourself and, uh, you know, that you got so many responses and then the response from the musician in my band was similar. You know, that's, you know, that's enough data for me. So there you go. Yeah. Learn the lesson. So uh, we have, we have several very, very loyal and engaged listeners out there. And uh, Kevin uh, sent in several things. And so good. Yeah. It was just awesome. I want to I, I want to go through. I think we'll be able to go through two of them here, maybe even more. But um, but the first one he uh, he shared, he says, you know, a few episodes ago, you guys were learning, talking about learning new songs and how to approach how whether or not to keep that song. He says, so years ago, I settled on what I tend to refer to as the rule of three. And that is where if a song isn't coming together by the third rehearsal, we drop it and move on because there are literally thousands of songs from which to choose. And so many hours we have together as a band to rehearse them. He says, there's probably an exception or two in there, of course, but I believe this has helped us not get bogged down. He says, plus when we have a song that just comes together on the first time we try it, it serves as a notable contrast to that one that just isn't working. Yeah, this is, you know, uh, this is one of those things when I read it, it was like, gosh, I wish I could rewind like 30 years and just show up at the first rehearsal with like my first band or whatever it was and offer this rule in, you know, or this suggestion in for everyone to adopt before anyone is emotionally committed to anything. (laughs) You know what I mean? Well, the problem with the rule of three, which is a great rule, and I and I actually think it's it's great advice yeah the problem is is that if you've made good progress by the third rehearsal but you're not there yet right so there is the concept of high risk high reward right sometimes i know we have some we have maybe half a dozen songs that i would call big production songs there's horn charts or you know original horn charts there's four three four part harmonies i mean there's there's a lot of things going on in these songs and sometimes they get they go out to medleys of other things and sure you know, there's stuff going on uh, and they take longer than three rehearsals. Yep. But I feel like you could take this concept of the rule of three. And of course, you know what I'm about to say couldn't possibly happen from day one with any band, but you, you know, as you learn your band, you can adapt a policy like this to what works for you. So, you know, like with fling, we have, we will play through like stumble through is what I call it. Stealing a a term from the theater world. We will stumble through playing a song for the first time together, you know, and we may have only all just heard it. Like one person comes in, hopefully knowing it cold, but the rest of the people like might not have even heard it that day. So we play it, you know, on speakers in the studio here. And then we, we try and run it and we don't expect perfection, but we are looking for those little like, okay, how did we lock in on this? Does it fit with what we do well together? You know, and it's like, okay, if there's enough of that, then let's, you know, let's plan next rehearsal. Let's, let's all, you know, be intentional about coming here with this. And, and, you know, and then we sort of move move forward and we, we do find it is generally a three rehearsal thing. If it's not coming together, by the third rehearsal, which usually will, will, you know, will punt on it. Uh, but there have been some that, that where it's, you know, necessary to, to take it further. And you know that it is like, in, you, you know, just like you said, you're like, well, you're at the third rehearsal. You can see the end of the tunnel. You're not there yeah. yet. And, and I feel like, you know, you learn what works for your band and then, 
and then just well, that's just that's actually it. the most important thing. Yeah. So he, here's here's the here's the side flank to the rule of three. I have a couple of guys in my band that I would say literally crave complexity. They need you know like they need a couple songs that are challenges. They and right and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm waving my hand here. Well, I, I know that I'm that guy. Yeah, I, I know, know that, and so but I also appreciate like a simple tune that just drives, right? Like, I mean, I, I, I like both sides of it, but I definitely understand the, the desire to challenge myself with complexity for sure. So uh, we're going through this with the house rockers right now. So we're starting to think about new music for next year. And, you know, I don't know how, if I'll be able to be available for weekly rehearsals. Oh, now. Yeah. So I'm right. trying to figure out how do we best use our time and what have we learned over the past? And so good discussion in the band about how to suggest songs and, you know, we can cover that another time, but I'll give you two analogies, two sure. examples. One, uh, Eddie Money passed away this this summer and um, in September, and um, we wanted to do a tribute to him. And so, you know, I asked everybody, do you, do you know Two Tickets to Paradise? Everybody nodded their head, no rehearsal, showed up, nailed it absolutely perfectly. Great, you know, great experience. That's and great. there are probably many, many more classic rock songs that you could do that with. Tell totally. everybody- you know, just come ready on this and it'll be done. Not a hard form, you know, not not a, a lot of um, harmonies to, you know, to to polish up. No. And, um, and a so good chance that everybody in your band is not listening to these songs for the first time when they're yes. listening to learn them for the band. Right. Yes. Yep. So we have that. And then we have other songs. So I think I told you we tried to do uh, Rare Earth. I just want to celebrate. Yeah. Which sure seems like a simple song. Well, when that's you listen problem. to it. It's too Holy simple. Crap. Oh my God. No, but it's not simple. I mean, the form, it has a couple little weirdnesses to it. Yep. You know, the, uh, you know, it, it's very sparse in places. And if your band is used to filling up the space, it's a terrible song for you. It's vocally intensive. It's, um, you know, it was a lot. And again, it was, that was when I brought in, we're three, four, five rehearsals into trying to, you know, find the right way to it. It wasn't going to happen. So I finally punted it and I felt terrible because I used up the guy's time you know, not, no, not full three hour rehearsals only on this one song, but, but a lot of time and effort was put into it. And, you know, that's the other thing. If you're the guy who brought in the song that is going to be subject to the rule of three, you know, if you know it's that it, if it doesn't get past the rule of three, you've wasted everybody's time. You might be a little bit more humble in, you know, choosing the songs that you're going to put out there. They're going to take that long. Well, that, and that's where you need to have, I mean, for a lot of reasons, you need to have trust in your band. But this is one of those times where, it, you know, people have heard like Russ and I were involved in a business venture a few years ago. And this was after we had been in a band together for 10 years. Right. And we were designing a website. We were at a designer's office talking through things. And we were, you know, we were being very efficient communicating with each other. But this other guy who we also happen to know, who was this designer uh, whose company we had hired, uh, he said to us, he's like, man, he's like, you guys are ruthless to each other. And it was like, hmm. oh, right. We kind of looked at yeah. each other like, you're OK, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, we didn't even realize how efficient we were being with our conversation. But direct. it was it was direct. It was not polite. It was like, it was just like, I think that doesn't work because of this. I was like, right. OK. You know, and we just move on. And. I, we both realized, you know, we talk, sort of talked about it briefly there and then in the, you know, in the car ride or whatever back, it was like, we're OK, right? Like he didn't identify some problem <laughs> we have here. It was like, no, we're just we've done this so many times. And we're in those scenarios where, like you said, you only have a few hours together a week, sometimes even a few hours a month together. However, you know, your schedules work and you need to learn how to be respectful, but also trust your your fellow bandmates that if you're the one like you said if you bring it in it's hard it's not impossible but it's difficult to sort of detach yourself from the emotional commitment to i really want this song to work and and look at it objectively like this is the wrong band for this song to work in you know it's not that it's a bad song you're certainly not a bad person this is a bad fit that's all mm -hmm. you know and you move on and sometimes you need somebody else in the band to be like yeah no there was, in fact, there was something now that we're, I didn't even dawn on me, but now that we're talking about it at the last fling rehearsal, Russ had this original that, that he had brought in and, and we've been working on for a few rehearsals. And for whatever reason I was, you know, we're still like experimenting with it. So coming up with different grooves and different feels. And I came up with some, I don't know, some thing that I was doing on the drums and it was pretty busy. 
And, you know, we finished the song and Russ is like, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool what you're doing there, but you, you can't do that for this song. <laughs> It's like, mm-hmm. okay, no problem. You know, just move move right on. It was like I I didn't even there wasn't even that twinge of of mm-hmm. of of hurt or whatever. It was like, yeah, okay, cool. That, you know, that's great. Somebody else's ear, you know, you'd sort of trust each other to be the producers in that in that environment. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and and obviously if I had thought that this was like, no, 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 you're not hearing what I'm hearing, whatever, like we would have had the conversation, but uh, you know, as soon as he said it, it was like, yeah, okay, fine. No problem. Yep, move on. I think the rule of three is a great conversation for a band to Bingo. have. Like, yeah. You know, it, it is literally, let's agree to these ground rules. Let's agree to this construct of that, you know, we have limited amount of time, you know, the risk for reward, you know, we got to take that into account. Yeah. If, if something's going to take three rehearsals, it better deliver a pretty high re- reward as opposed to the two tickets for paradise scenarios where we could do all day. But, you know, I think most bands, certainly most professional bands want a little bit more than, you know, the types of songs that you can just yeah. slap out there. Right. Yeah. So, you know, right. There's right. that, there is that value of, of the songs that take a little bit more time. Absolutely. Yeah. Some but are going to take longer. Yeah. Yes. But the conversation amongst the band, let's agree to this. Let's all buy into this and, you know, don't be butthurt, you know, but three is the, is the goal. So after two, Number three, you know, better bring bring us home. Uh, you know, that's a good use of our time. It could happen to anybody. I mean, I, I actually, with the conversation with the House Rockers, I had said, I think we have time this year for two, maybe three songs that will be that take multiple rehearsals. A stretch, we, yeah. We yeah. should really, you know, up our game in terms of individual preparation and, you know, come into rehearsal you know, ready to go. And let's, let's, you know, for us, if we add 10 to 12 songs in a year, that's, that's a pretty average year for us. More than that is, is a lot lot. less than that. I think we've kind of failed and we haven't used our time very well. So, you know, I'm starting to think about, you know, how how can we use the time, especially if it's going to be limited time. So three rehearsals might be three months, right. You know, especially if we only, if 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 I'm going to move three hours away and we can only rehearse once a month, how are we going to use that time better? But I think this idea and Kevin's suggestion is awesome. Great, a great rule of thumb, but starts with a great band conversation. It, yeah, it's just a, yeah, you just need to come up with your own rule. I, you know, as we're talking about this, you had come up and thank goodness you did uh, with a similar rule for the Macworld All-Star Band, which was not only it was the rule of one, but it was like mm-hmm. very much like the rule of one period because we had one rehearsal before every gig and we would, you know, we'd probably play what 25 songs in a gig or whatever it was. And we would have 40 songs. We would come in with the, you know, we would start with our, our set list, you know, conversations months before, and we'd sort of whittle it down to something in the neighborhood of 35 or 40. And we would know that there were going to be 10 or 15 that were not going to make it. And the rule of one was not that it had to be done in one rehearsal. It was that it had to be done in one take. We yeah. played, every, we had only enough time to play all 40 of those songs once. And by the end, at the end of each song, whoever was band leader for that year made a little note. And, uh, you know, that was whether or not it was put on the set list. And sometimes there was a conversation about it. Like, uh, is this one going to make the list? Like oftentimes the response to that was, what do you think? You know, yeah. <laughs> like if you have to ask the question, where do you think the borderline is on this? <laughs> yeah. Cause it's just for once. Sure. Yeah. No. And it, I mean, for that particular scenario, that was exactly the right rule to have. Otherwise we would have never been prepared for a gig because we would have tried to play us. Oh, we didn't get it quite right. Let's play it again. Oh no, 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 no. I mean, there were a few songs over the years where we, we, once we started to build up a little catalog and we didn't have to rehearse everything, there were a couple where it's like, well, let's come back to that at the end and see what happens. And like songs like Freeway Jam made it into the the show, you know, at times. Mm. I was like, that's that's cool. It's kind of crazy, but sure. But yeah. we were ready. But we were ready. Yeah, exactly. We 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 weren't scared or we weren't unprepared. We were always scared because it's good to go to stage a little scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun. Let me ask you, what does what does does Fling look at the winter time as a time to refresh your set list? No, it, it really we don't. We it's sort of an an always ongoing process. And, you know, Fling is in, it, quite frankly, in a period of of re um, reimagination right now. And we sort of have been for a little while with Aaron's, um, you know, Aaron. So Aaron moved. Not only has he for the last several years had to 
basically travel Monday through Friday almost every week. Mm. Um, yeah, which has been a real like sort of, you know, that's been an interesting thing to navigate for us all. And we've talked a little bit about that here. But now his home is is an hour away from where we all are here instead of, you know, whatever, 10 minutes away or whatever it was before. Right. So um, so it you know, that that intention that you were talking about with what you're, you know, sort of predicting for the house rockers, um, that has certainly been a part of it. You know, when we play gigs, we add new songs. There are times at a gig where we will play a song that Aaron has never even heard before, let alone played. Uh, you know, we like we did one of Mike's originals at that last gig we just played and Aaron had never heard it before. But I knew like, you know, I mean, we played together for a long time. I'm like, OK, cool. Yeah. Well, I know by the second chorus, I know There's where that. I know what harmony he's going to hit, you know, yeah. and I'll just change and and I'll go hit the one above him or below him or whatever. And and it did. It worked out great. But, you know, like that's not optimal. As great as it is to be able to walk on stage and be like, I know how this we're not even going to talk about it. I know how it's going to go. That's cool. But it would be way better if we could have had three rehearsals together with that tune, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I think that's actually a superpower. So I, I told you I have this band that plays with me at a coffee shop, you know, big coffee shop, but it's a coffee shop. I send them the set list. We don't rehearse. And I say, I expect you to come with big ears and to, you know, know, know the essence of these songs. Right. And my expectations for those gigs are much more open. Um, and, and I know what these musicians can do. I know them and I know enough of how they think that I know that I've picked the right guys for that type of project. Yep. Right. Right. House rockers are a different thing that, you know, yes. there's, there's places for structure. There's places for open. There's, there's, you know, and this is, a, you know, this goes back to our first conversation. This is a little bit of the value of a leader led band as opposed to a full democracy. Sure. Now, a full democracy yep. has the upside of buy-in, you know, has the upside of everybody's, you know, constantly getting their votes. And, but in a leader led band, you can kind of play your hunches a little bit differently and, you know, know where the strengths are. Totally. And, and you know, so, you know, again, there's, there's not a right or wrong. There's strengths and weaknesses to each approach. And there's, and there, and it's not a, you know, a binary thing either. Right. There's like, you know, I, I love the idea of continuums. Like there, there are, there are middle ground there where you've got, for sure. you, you know, yeah, exactly. You've got one person or two people in the band that, are good at seeing that. And so they lead that part of the process and someone else might lead a different part of it or whatever it is. Yeah. And you know, you you and I are similar in many ways and and in this way in particular, like when we think we know something, it's really hard to get it off of our, you know, like when you know you're right. (laughs) Well, well, no, I'm just saying when you know, you know, right. That's it. Like I said, I I always think I'm right. Right. So, um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you're right. Yeah. When you know that, you know, and your gut tells you, you know, it's hard, man. I'm, yeah, that is definitely a character flaw. But it's also <laughs> like the thing that has has propelled me through life, too. So, right. yeah. But that's what you're saying. It's not binary. There's no there's degrees. I mean, there, there's sometimes it works for you. Sometimes it doesn't work for you. Sometimes often it it's in the middle. Burns. Well, but often it's in the middle. Right. Yep. It, often it's like, it, I, you know, this essence of this angle of this problem I can solve this one. I can't. And yep. so it, that's part of the life lesson stuff. So it is, I have yeah. a life lesson for everybody and that <laughs> is stop wasting your money on your wireless. As I said at the beginning of the show, mint mobile is one of our sponsors here this week. And if you are still using one of the big wireless providers in 2019, have you asked yourself what you're paying for? Because, you know, they've got their expensive retail stores, they've got their inflated prices with hidden fees and other things that are basically, in essence, taking advantage of you because they know you'll pay. Well, Mint Mobile knows all this and Mint Mobile wants to make your life way easier and less expensive by providing the same premium network coverage that you're used to at a fraction of the cost because... Everything is online. They save on those expensive retail locations because they don't have them. They don't add in extra fees because they choose not to. And then they pass those savings directly along to you. And because of all that, Mint Mobile makes it super easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. And the coverage is stellar. I've been using Mint Mobile all over the country here. It has been fantastic because they run on T-Mobile's network. They control 
everything, the billing, you are a Mint Mobile customer, but they're leveraging the strength of that nationwide T-Mobile network. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. And with Mint Mobile, you also get to stop paying for unlimited data that you never use. No one uses unlimited. You use a certain amount. So you get to choose between plans with 3, 8, or 12 gigs of 4G LTE data a month. You can bring your own phone to Mint Mobile, keep your same phone number, of course, all your existing contacts and everything. That obviously comes along. But what you get to get rid of is your old wireless bill, and you can start saving with Mint Mobile. So here's how we do this. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash giggab. That's mintmobile.com slash giggab. The link is always in the show notes if you forget. So you can cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash giggab. And our thanks to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode. Thanks, Mint Mobile. Kevin sent in another email that I felt like I know I normally don't like to do two from the same person in an episode, but, and I almost like assign this to somebody else, but I don't, I don't like to be dishonest, you know, at least not, not, not to you folks. Um, but Kevin has run into a problem recently with his in-ear monitors and wireless in general. And I wanted to kind of share this and maybe we have a little conversation about it, but, but maybe it's just advice from Kevin. Uh, he says, um, over the past three to four years, as equipment has been updated, he says, um, we've had to learn to consciously cho choose to buy units that are all different frequencies. He says, back in 2007, when I first invested in in-ear monitors for everyone in his band, he says, I didn't think too much about those being in the same frequency band as the wireless mics. He said, because back then it was totally fine. Fast forward several years, and especially as other bands have gotten more into using IEMs, where there were a few festivals he's had where he says a ton of interference cropped up. And he says in one particularly eye-opening experience at the largest festival in the area, we could not get an open channel for the wireless mics, which turned into a mad scramble for some SM58s with extra long XLR cables. And he says, of course, all this happening in the typical 30 minute changeover that we routinely lament here. He says it was all very embarrassing. He says, so when I updated our IEM systems from PSM 700s, these are the sure systems to PSM 900s, uh, he says, I intentionally bought units that were a slightly lower frequency band than uh, our beta 87 SLX 24 systems were. And he says both are in the 500 megahertz band, but they do not overlap. He says, and then the guitar and the bass use the line six wireless system, which uh, is in the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is kind of where uh, sort of older Wi-Fi and uh, and those sorts of things also live. So just be aware of that too. Bluetooth is also in 2.4 gigahertz. He says uh, it was two years before I had to scan a body pack for a clean channel, but Twice this summer, he says, I've had to do that. Uh, and he says, I did have both the old and new IEM systems at the same time in case anybody would need to hot swap in a pinch. Plus, he says, I only need to have one spare body pack for guitars on hand for emergencies. He says, I realize this is all easier to do if everything is bought new at the same time and or one person makes the investment. He says, both of which were the case for me. But if a group is making the investment collectively, whether individually or, you know, separately, whatever, uh, he says, this is definitely something I'd encourage people to consider. Yeah, it this is it like you really got to think about this stuff. I mean, his scenario with, you know, other bands at a festival, that's sort of the insult to the injury that you can't control. But you certainly can and need to control what's going on in your own band. I've run into this on gigs, especially like pickup gigs or those kind of things where multiple people are coming together and everybody's sort of bringing their own gear uh, and you might have, you know, two people that have never played together before and everybody's got to really be aware of, OK, you know, how are we going to do this? When I joined Uptown, I guess, oh, it was we, my first gig with Uptown. We had a a sub a female singer who now is our permanent singer. Um, and Rachel's great, which is awesome. But I think she brought her own wireless mic. And I remember there being like a mad scramble in the midst of a, you know, a mayhem day as they, as these setups often are where it was like, okay, wait a minute. Like we need to sort this out. Who wins? Who's the, who's the, you know, 
most important? What channel is most important? That one wins. Okay, what's number two? What's number three? And it was just going down the list. You don't want to have to stop everyone and do that if you can avoid it. And so being really intentional about what you're doing with your band and when someone gets something new, rehearse with the wireless stuff. I know it seems like overkill, but you want to not just rehearse to make sure your sound is right. You also want to rehearse to make sure that your setup is right and compatible with everybody else there and turn on your wireless mixer. Because if you're using those line six things or whatever, you just want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're not competing for the same uh, spectrum. 2.4 is a little better managed than the 500 megahertz stuff, but even still, uh, you know, you don't want you. You are going to have plenty of surprises at gigs that you can't control. You tr want to try and predict and avoid the ones that you can. So it's good yeah. advice from Kevin. Do you, have you guys run into any of this, Paul? Oh, gosh. Poor Bill is lucky <laughs> to have any hair left. So every single gig, every single room, there's different types of, you know, rescanning things. And, you know, it's it's we have five wireless mics for the horns six actually oh yeah we have you know right. two wireless guitars we have five six wireless maybe seven in-ears yep we have a lot right yeah and you know mostly we're running into problems with um the samson brand mics not usually not the shures but the samson wireless mics seem to need to be rescanned often that's weird i wonder why that is i mean my guess is that they're all using the same it's probably the same, you know, Broadcom chips or something in them, right? Like, that's weird that they would need to be rescanned. That's interesting, huh? Yeah. Yep. 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 It's a pain in the neck. I, you know, I have, um, I have gone back and forth on using wireless for my in-ears. And at the moment I am using. Uh, what would the value be for a drummer though? You're well, not going anywhere. That's exactly it, Paul. Yep. There is no value. A, it's an extra battery to manage for me. And B, all of the stuff we just mentioned, right? Like, I'm, you're right. I'm not going anywhere. I can just plug into a cable. The only, there was only Do you one. you come up and sing? I have at times, um, it, you know, especially when Fling had two drummers. That was a time when I was using wireless because I would spend, you know, half the gig at the front of the stage and half the back. Um, but um, it, it, you know, it's. It's a it's extra to manage and usually up front, not the whole band was not on IEM. So there was enough, you know, uh, stage wedge stuff up there that it that I was OK. But um, yeah, it, it like the only time in recent history that I wished I was using wireless was it was a madhouse. And the way madhouse works is we have some shows are organized where you know, the band plays, I don't know, whatever, you know, some percentage of the songs and then some percentage are tracked. And if it's just if it's like band song, track song, band song, I'll stay at my drums. The whole band will stay on stage just during the track song. But if it's band song, eight tracked songs, band song, it's like, well, I'm going to go and, you know, peace out for a little bit. And, and it's fine. And I was coming back on stage. I needed to plug in the song that we were coming back for was a. Um, a clicked song. So we were playing along with a track. We had some stuff in the track that was, you know, that was going along, which is fine. And I'm, I get on stage and I'm fumbling around trying to find my cable. And I thought I was so smart. I would use a black cable because, you know, I was using a black cable because it was, it didn't, <laughs> didn't show up on stage. Well, it turns out it doesn't show I'm up on stage. In the dark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I found it and plugged in, and heard a click like the moment I plugged in and it was like, is that one there's, I know I'm getting four <laughs> before I come in, which one was that? So I just assumed it was one and it turns out it was, but that was a very lucky guess. Like that was, you know, 25% chance I was right. And, uh, and it all worked out, but now I use white cables for my uh, in-ears on stage and and there have been many opportunities where i've walked on you know into a, a, a dark stage and it's like yep it's right there i can see it so can everybody else but you know what the most important person can see it and that's me <laughs> yeah, for yeah. Sure. so yeah i've thought about putting like you know led tape or something on it or whatever but then it's yet another battery i have to manage and stuff it's like uh, it's just white big long 25 foot white cable i'm gonna find that thing if i need it so funny yeah that's sort of funny so it's funny now definitely now, now, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, we do have to thank Kevin for all these great. I mean, he, what we we covered two of about. 15 yeah. <laughs> topics that he sent us thoughtful, you know, informed. He has this killer band. So he's got this, these great experiences and, you know, that, that are real valuable, you know, practical advice that he gives us. So thank you for sending all that stuff, Kevin. We'll get to this stuff over the course of time, but we really appreciate all the ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for, you know, everyone else, uh, please do send us your stuff. Feedback at gig We love to hear from you. It like, you know, Paul and I have our experiences. I'm actually so we've talked about subs a lot, Paul. I am going to see Little Feet tonight and Paul Barrere is not playing the gig, which That's is weird, weird. Yeah. Lisa and I, we thought, OK, well, you know, maybe we just punt. On How this. did you find out he's not playing the gig? There was an article on uh, like consequence, consequence of sound or whatever. He's having some health issues. Wait, wait, wait. But 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 net net, if you hadn't seen the article, you would have shown up and yes. it would have been someone else. Correct. Yeah. That's yeah. Weird. Yeah. Which is weird. Yeah. It's a little like I'm glad I, I went in knowing we went some somebody had seen them last week or whatever and had filmed some video, you know, as people do from the show or whatever. So we were able to see and it's like, OK, you know, Bill Payne's singing a lot of the tunes. They've got uh, Larry Campbell and Teresa Williams also playing with them. Larry sings a couple of the songs and and he's a great like he is a great person in that band he's played with them a lot in their jamaica shows and things like that um and they've got three horns with them for this because it's their 50th anniversary tour so it, it's a it's a bummer that i don't get to see paul barrere but after watching those videos it was like all right maybe we're not wasting our time maybe we should go you know so so we're going so uh, we'll see i mean you know it's a night out instead of a night in that's usually well, and it's be still little feet so the songs are amazing and the playing's gonna be i mean you and i had the privilege of meeting those guys and yeah uh, almost having a private concert with those guys, you know, several years ago. And yeah. it was wonderful. I mean, oh. they're, they're really masters of what they do. They are. Lisa, you know, when we were watching the videos, Lisa's been, she's probably going to hate me for saying this uh, publicly, but she's been playing piano some and, and like taking some like online lessons and stuff, which is great. And she was watching, you know, Bill Payne started some tune or whatever. And she's like, look at how fluid his hands are on that instrument. It's like, well, that dude's a master. She's like, but how does he even play? I'm like, yeah, well, a lot of people ask that question and some of them have been playing piano for, you know, more years than we've been alive. So <laughs> yeah, I just, the thing about little feet to me is just the, the fusion of those, those groove styles, you know, with a lot of the, you know, the second line stuff and it's just, and it, it becomes pop music, not, not that strictly cultural music. I just, right. I just no, they've it. made it. You're right. They made it pop music. That's right. And you know, to be fair, Paul Barrera was not an original member of the band either. Right. You know, but he's, he's I identified know. as no, yeah. no. Yeah. 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 I, yes, no, it, it, it will be weird seeing them without him. I was sort of hoping when I started reading the article that he wasn't going to be there. I'm like, Oh, did they get, did they convince Craig Fuller to come in for, you know, three gigs or whatever, five gigs or whatever. It turns out to be that Paul has to miss. And, yeah. and no, that would have been nice. No. I got to see him with Craig Fuller once. Um, I don't know. It's probably yeah, 25 years ago or something, you know, when he was with them and he, you know, he was great, but that was before they figured out that they didn't need someone to replace Lowell George, that they could do it with Barrer and, and, you know, and mm -hmm. the other guys. Um, uh, and I, and I, I've always kind of liked them as, as that unit, you know, the one that we saw where it's just them. So <laughs> Yeah, tonight will be different, but that's okay. It turns out I've seen various incarnations of Little Feet over the years, and I've liked every one. We'll see how this one goes. You know, take it from there. I look forward to a report. I, ha I will have lots of reports. I think I'm seeing Preservation Hall on mm. Saturday, and then I've got an Uptown gig and something else. It's going to be a busy weekend, man. So, yeah. Good. Yep, which is good. It is. It music, is. music, music, music. It, it is. It's all music. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, all right, folks, that's it. Remember, visit our sponsors. They're in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com, but Vanzoogle with promo code giggab and mintmobile.com slash giggab. And send us an email, which is feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We want to hear from you. In the meantime, what do we have to say, Mr. Kent? You got to always be performing. <laughs>